Good morning and welcome everybody. I've been, I've been asked to uh, share with you four scriptures. One of them is a little long, so be patient. The first one you're going to recognize right off. Part of the Ten Commandments. From Exodus 20. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. From Psalm 90, this is prayer, the prayer of Moses, man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place for all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. You've swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning, they're like grass, which sprouts anew. In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening, it fades and withers away. For we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath, we have been dismayed. You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our lives, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? So teach us to number our days that we may present, present to you a heart of wisdom. Do return, O Lord. How long will it be? And be, sorrow, be sorry for your servants. O oh, satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years that we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm to, for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. From Isaiah 43, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. From Colossians 1, he, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominations or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The, the word from, from, the, from the good book. Pastor Bob's now going to knit it all together. I, uh, I need to tell you, uh, there's someone must really need to hear this ser sermon this morning. Uh, I ha had, uh, well, it's been an ch interesting and challenging week. Uh, I can say that much, but it's a wonderful week. But when I got ready to print the study guide and also to print off my personal notes, my printer quit working. I had just an hour before that printed off the bulletin, both sides. Everything was fine. When I got ready to print 
these notes for today's message. The uh, nozzle, I guess, plugged up, and I never got anywhere. And I was up till 1.30 this morning trying to get my printer to work. And then I woke up at 6. So if anybody has a right to fall asleep during my sermon, it's me. <laughs> so I sent Steve, I didn't know if he was up or not, but I sent him a text about 11.54 last night saying, are you up? <laughs> Apparently he wasn't because I didn't hear anything back. But I texted him this morning and he uh, graciously agreed that if I'd send him the file, he would print the print that material off, so thank you, Steve, for doing that. I made a comment about it on my Facebook page, because I was really excited about today's sermon, and uh, one of my friends wrote back, and uh, she made this uh, observation. She said, uh, God has uh, called uh, Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 11 to my mind, so here's what I thought I'd uh, share with you. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but it does have a lot to do with the circumstances surrounding all of it. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Apparently he knows about printers. <laughs> For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So, if you happen to be one that uh, God brought here today to hear the stumbling words that I'll share with you, uh, I'm glad. Uh, several days ago, actually two or three weeks ago, uh, I preached, I think our second, the second sermon in the series, I preached on choosing the right God uh, in order to be able to deal with uh, the challenges of uh, our current culture. And in doing that, and it was from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, one of the scriptures that, uh, that Paul read just a moment ago, but I began thinking about this. And I don't know why it crossed my mind, but I began thinking about what would life be like for you and me if God was not eternal? I don't know if you've thought about that or not. But if you study the idea, if you think it through, you realize that if God was not eternal, our religion would be just like all the rest. And it's the fact that God is eternal that makes everything about the gospel message come alive and become real and practical in our lives. And I haven't heard very many preachers preach on the subject of God being eternal, although we almost all of us believe that to be the case. When... When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, we know from Scripture that God created them to live in a personal, intimate relationship with Him. Genesis 1.26 tells us that we were created in the image of God and in the likeness of God and that He gave us the responsibility of ruling over all the rest of His creation and being good stewards of it. But there was another voice that came along not too long after they were placed there. And he began to ask questions of Adam and Eve. Did God really say this? Did he really say, eat from everything here? Enjoy all of this, but just don't eat from that one tree. Out of thousands of trees, only one was off limits. And, of course, you know the story. And as a result of that, from that moment in the garden, mankind has been in the business of creating his own gods. Because that's really what happened in the third chapter of Genesis. As I've 
those of you who are regulars here, you know time and time again these past eight years I've talked about the fact that when Adam and Eve were tempted, they were not tempted to turn their backs on God and follow the serpent. They were tempted to turn their backs on God and live their own lives, become independent from God. And that still is the struggle that all of us face every day of our lives. We are dealing with issues where we have to make choices. Am I going to trust God with this or am I going to try to handle it myself? And of course, over a period of generations, God raised a man up out of the Ur of Chaldees, which was a polytheistic culture, brought him to Canaan, and he had, God gave him a promise that he would bless the world through Abraham's seed, Abraham's seed. Those people grew and multiplied and finally ended up through a number of circumstances that you're familiar with to where they were in bondage in Egypt. And God raised up another man named Moses. And he had the responsibility of leading them out of, the, out of Egypt into the wilderness and through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Someone said one time it took God three days to get them out of Egypt. It took 40 years to get Egypt out of them. And I suppose that's very true. You and I still have struggles with our Egypts, don't we? Or maybe I shouldn't have said that. But in that process, when God brought them, after about a year in the wilderness, he gave them what we call the Ten Commandments. And last week, Joanne and I had the opportunity of watching a video of a pastor out of Dallas, Texas, Robert Morris. And he was beginning a series on the Ten Commandments, and he talked about that first commandment. And... Uh, God chose to identify himself in a totally and a unique way. And he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, he pointed out something very interesting. The Hebrew text there basically doesn't mean that the children of Israel were to have a choice of choosing which God, and they could worship these other gods, or they could worship him, but what he was basically saying is, you will worship no other God besides me, because there is no other God. Now that's hard for us, because we think of all the different religions around us, and we realize polytheism is there, but here's what we need to realize. Those are not gods. They're images, they're statues, they're trees, they're cows, they're whatever they may be that people put their faith and trust in, but actually they are nothing more than flesh and bone and stone and clay and rock. There is only one God, and that brings us to the point of today's message, and that is the reason there is only one God and all of these others are mirages, are figments of people's imagination, is because, exclusively because, God is eternal. And listen, if God is not eternal, he can't be God. By the very definition of who God is, the very idea of God automatically houses, contains within it the reality that God always has been, still is, and always will be God. No matter what happens to you, no matter the circumstances, no matter how chaotic the world becomes, God is God. And so... That was one of the things that really, I think, caught my attention as the more I thought about it is how important it is for us to realize that God is an eternal God. Now, what, what if he had not been eternal? I mean, think about it. What about, what if God had not been eternal? In other words, when I say he 
if he were not eternal, that means that he has never existed forever. That there was a some place back in history where God didn't exist. Or there was a circumstance in your life today where God didn't exist and he wasn't real. Or how about looking to the future and anticipating the future and saying, well, God's going to die someday, just like all human beings do. And so there'll be, if he dies before I do, then I'm, I have a period in my life to live without God. <coughs> do you see how important it is that we understand that the God that we know, the God that we love, and the God that we serve is eternal. He never changes. What kind of rela difference would it make in your relationship to God if he were not eternal? How would this affect, for example, your salvation? Is your salvation resting upon someone who is born, lives for a while, and then dies? How can a non-eternal God give you eternal life? It's impossible, you see. Now, there are a lot of things that are not eternal, and I've listed those in the study guide for you to think about. But uh, the word eternal actually appears, I think, some 75 or more times. And uh, most of it is uh, not so that we can understand all that, but uh, so that hopefully we will have a sense of hope and confidence in him. But every time that it is used, almost every time it's used, it's used in relationship to God or something about God. And in essence, it is talking about the fact that God always was, always has been, always will be, is now, and always will be in the future. But you can see the fact, for example, that the universe isn't eternal. Now think about this, and the reason I point this out is because most scientists believe that the universe itself, which is huge and still growing, um, had a beginning. They think that it began some 20 billion years ago or more. And yet we know that there's no evidence to prove that. There is no evidence to prove, I mean, there, there is no evidence to prove that the universe is eternal because it's not eternal. It had a beginning point. Now you can call it a big bang or whatever you want to call but the point is, the universe has not always existed. Carl Sagan ran into this and all these other uh, evolutionary guys that talk about it. They all have to acknowledge that there's one question they cannot answer. And that is, when did life begin? And what is life? There are certain elements that you have to have in order for something to happen. And this, I won't try to get into all of this, but you have the thing of the cause and the effect. The effect is the universe exists. So the question is, what caused it? It just didn't happen. You can't create something out of nothing unless you're God, <laughs> you see. And so... This is a sort of a reference point, I suppose you could say, to help us see something at least of the eternality of God, the fact that he is so eternal. Mankind has not existed, is not eternal. You can see that. Even marriage and the family is not eternal. There's a point in time where the Bible tells us that we will, there will neither be marriage or given in marriage. We're all going to be exactly on the same footing and in the same role in God's presence in heaven. Angels are not eternal. They were created beings. The devil is not eternal. If the devil was eternal, he'd be God, you see. So all of these different things, but God truly is eternal. And I listed some several verses of Scripture, and I just gave the reference points to you, but I want you to listen to some of these as I read them. Isaiah 40, verse 28. 
Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Psalm 90, verse 2 from our text this morning. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, your God. Deuteronomy 33. There's none like the God of uh, Jeshurun, which is not a person or a place, it's a concept, who rides the heavens to to your help and through the skies in his majesty. The eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Jesus spoke in Revelation 22, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In referring to Jesus in Hebrews 13a, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I love what he said in John 8, 58. He said to his disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, before, listen to this, before Abraham was, I am. Remember the story when God called Moses at the burning bush? And after Moses had exhausted all of his excuses not to do what God wanted, Moses finally gave in and says, okay, okay, so if I'm going to do this and go to Pharaoh, I mean, you know Pharaoh, don't you, God? You should know what Pharaoh's like. So when I go to him, who am I going to tell him sent me? And what did God say? Tell him I am. Now, why does God use that phrase? And why did Jesus use it for himself? Because the phrase I am basically means constantly the same in the past, the present, and the future. I am who I am. If you want to know a little bit more about Jesus, study the Gospel of John. Because in John, Jesus describes some 15 or 16 times who he is. I am the Good Shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the door to the sheepfold. Over and over and over again. This ought to bring us a degree of hope and encouragement, but particularly confidence to realize that the moment that I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I have tapped in to an eternal God that is all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present. One of my favorite psalms that I love to teach from, I've taught it here years ago, Psalm 139. In that psalm, you find the, the omnipresence of God, first of all. It's, it's, it has 24 verses to it, and it, there are four stanzas. The first stanza, first six verses, describe Jesus in the fact, or describe God as his presence. Wherever you are, you can go through the process of death, and I'm there. You can go to the early morning, and I'm there. You can go to the mountains, and I'm there. You can go to the, to, to the desert, and I'm there. Wherever you are, God is there. See, he's there. Can you see him? No, but you can see the evidence. The second stanza then deals with what God knows. He said, you know my inner thoughts. You know this about me. You know my inward being. And the words that are used there, by the way, are so interesting because they describe the pre-born baby, his innermost beings, his vital organs, his bones still in the mother's womb, and he says, you know all about me. In Isaiah chapter 40, God told Cyrus, I knew you before you were born. You see, over and over again, we find this truth. Then the third stanza describes to us the power of God. That God is omnipotent. So you have God in his omniscience, God in his omnipresence and God in his omnipotence. And this became so overwhelming to David that the last stanza describes David, David's reaction to all of that. 
And so David jumps up, seems to jump up at least in his mind, and he says, God, you are so incredible and awesome. He said, I'll tell you what, God, I hate everybody that hates you. And I'll fight, and I'll do this, that, and the other. And he goes on for about four verses, and then all of a sudden I think it dawns on him. And in verses 23 and 24, he is, oh my goodness, I'm talking to God here. And I'm in a mess myself. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. And try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Let's forget about those enemies over there. Just check me out. Where am I in my walk with you? And then he asks that question. Lead me in paths everlasting. Ongoing, continual paths. So if, if God is not eternal... There are some things that we need to understand. I listed five of them. I'm sure there are other things. If God is not eternal, then we do not have an effective way to deal with our past and our failures and our flaws and our sadness and our griefs and sorrows and our dishonesty and all the other stuff that we may have been guilty of in our past years. So if God is not an eternal God, how do you deal with the past? You can't. Then if he is not eternal, you have no inadequate strength to deal with today. You're pretty much on your own because you never know when God will die. You never know to sh for sure if God is even alive at all. If he is not eternal, maybe he died before you were born and all of this is a mirage and you're having to deal with today's life without him. Or also, your hope for tomorrow is useless. You're going to be just like the writer of Ecclesiastes that said, vanity, it's all vain. Life, life is just full of vain attempts to be happy when you can't be happy. So, you have to consider that, but here's one of the scary things, two last two things that I jotted down. If God is not eternal, then forgiveness of our sin is both impossible and unnecessary. Because you see, if God isn't eternal, then we have no day of accounting to stand before him, do we? And if we are not going to give account to God, then we don't need Jesus to be able to reconcile us and, and pay the price for our sin penalty. It all rests on the fact that God is a forever God. He is an eternal God. And then the last thing that we see is that if God is not eternal, then eternal life itself doesn't exist because eternal life can emanate only from something that's eternal. Does that make sense at all? And so this is what we need to understand. So if God isn't eternal, he can't be God because the whole idea is a contradiction. For us to believe in a God who's not eternal is a contradiction in terms. It's kind of like Peter, when he had that vision up on the mountain or on the rooftop of this person, uh, House of Cornelius, I think it was, and the, remember the story where the blanket or the sheet came down full of all kinds of food and Peter made one of the most interesting things. He made the statement because the angel had told him, says, eat. And it wasn't kosher. And as a good Jew, Peter wasn't about to eat something that wasn't kosher. And so he made a contradictory statement in three words. Not so, Lord. You can't say Lord and say not so. Because if you say not so, he's not Lord. And if you say Lord, you can never say not so to him. And so we deal with this issue, if God is not eternal, then our salvation isn't eternal, our past can't be changed, our present can't be controlled, your future can't be guaranteed, and our assurance, though, is the fact that God is eternal. But if he isn't, then everything is lost. It is all vanity. It's all futility. It's all a waste. Now let me tell you something. 
If you want to know why we have so many people that are trying to take their own lives, and if you want to know why certain countries like the Netherlands are performing euthanasia on people, certain people, individuals, adults, not just older people, but those that are, uh, I've forgotten the term that I want to use right now, but I just read the article this last week. See, when, when God is not eternal, you can do just about anything you want to and think you can get away with it. But if you understand that God is a forever God who has always existed, who is alive and well and exists today, and who will exist throughout all of your future and everything that you're going to face in the future, if you know that to be the case, then you can face life and you can face it with a sense of joy. Now, I don't have time to get into the text itself, but the 90th Psalm spells out nine specific things that Moses understood about God. Let me just mention them real quickly, and then we'll have to, you know, I'll have to leave it up to you. But God, first of all, in verse 1, God exists from all eternity, and He's never had a beginning. He says this, Lord, You have been our dwelling place in all generations, from everlasting to everlasting. Your God. And then we see that God created everything that is in verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. I love the story I heard years ago of uh, a scientist that came to God one day in prayer and he said, uh, I can do the same things you do. He said, I can take a handful of dirt and I can create life. And so God answered him back, says, really? Well, show me. And so the scientist reached down to the ground and took up a handful of dirt. And God said, "Uh uh-uh, get your own dirt. (laughs) Third thing that we see is that God exists outside of time. This is the thing that is such a mystery, but this is the reason God is eternal. God never operates on time, on a time frame. God is never conscious of time. This is why the Bible talks to us. He says, for a thousand years in your sight are are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. There was a guy who talked to God one day, and he said, "Uh, Lord, uh, how long is a million years to you? And God answered back, says, oh, about a minute. And then he said, well, uh, how much is a million dollars to you? And God said, uh, that's about a penny. And uh, the man said, oh, Lord, could I just have a penny? And he said, just a minute. (laughs) See, we can't get our hands, we can't get our minds around what it really means for God to be an eternal everlasting, forever, always existing God. But if you can get a hold of that, that's, if I could use it this way, this is what will put the rebar in your Christian faith. It's going to, it's what will strengthen you and help you as you go through all of these different experiences. Now, Moses went on and pointed out another, uh, other number of other things that I just have to leave for you to look at. Uh, at a later time, do your own reading and research. But the one thing that God wants us to do, I do want to point out the last two, verse 14. God wants our lives to be lives of joy. And lives of joy in spite of our heartaches and our hardships. Because he says, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. This is what David wrote in Psalm 51 after he had committed sin with Bathsheba. He said, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Not my joy, not my my salvation. The joy, your joy of your salvation. Jesus told his disciples, he says, I'm telling you these things so that you will have joy and that you will have my joy and because you have my joy, your joy will be full. 
And this is what he has in mind. So that God intends our life to be lives of joy, even in the middle of difficult times like we're facing. And then the last thing he says is that our life is secure because of God's eternality. And that refers back to that 139th Psalm that I told you about. So God's the only one who is eternal. Our Creator is ageless, timeless, uninterrupted, perpetual. And in His personality and His attributes, we find Him to be fully and eternal. If God, as I said before, if God isn't eternal, then everything is lost. But if He is, everything is secure. Everything is okay, even when it's not okay. So as a result of that, we can shout that theme that we're using for the season, unwavering assurance for uncertain days. So with that in mind, let's just have a word of prayer, and then we'll conclude the service this morning. And I, I have to be honest to tell you that this topic is so overwhelming to me that I find myself, you find this hard to believe, I know, but I'm at a loss for words after all that I've said. It's just, I don't know, it's one of those mouth open, gaping, wow, to think that God is eternal. And everything about your Christian faith rests on the fact that he's eternal, that he is a forever God. This is why Jesus was able to say, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's why the writer of Hebrews was able to say, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now his solution, well, let me just close with that. God is eternal. Let's thank him for that. He's not like the other gods. You know, I remember we, when Joanne and I were missionaries in Ukraine, and as most of you know, we, one of our main ministries there was to Farsi speakers, people particularly from Iran and Iraq, or, or um, Iran and Afghanistan. And I, don't, I can't tell you how many young men sat in our apartment around the table and talked about how they never had any hope. They never knew for sure. Because they could have lived lives that their good outweighed their bad all the way up till the instant before they had the car wreck and they had a bad thought about that stupid driver and then they died and that bad thought tipped the scale the wrong way. And that's the kind of assurance that they have. In fact, one of the young men that I had a chance to talk to, he told me, he said, even Muhammad didn't know if he would make it to heaven, to paradise. But Jesus is so clear, he said, you can have assurance. And I love that old hymn we used to sing, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, you see. And so whatever else you face, realize and remember that God is eternal. And because he's eternal, nothing catches him by surprise. He's been there before. And he has all the resources that you will ever need to face anything you ever face. But most importantly, the greatest gift that he offers you is eternal life. And Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in the third chapter of John, most famous verse of scripture in the Bible, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him, roll over on him, put your faith and trust in him, would never perish, but would have everlasting or eternal life. You know, I mean, it's profound. No other God has ever said that. Not one. 
all of the other so-called gods, figments of people's imagination, have absolutely no power other than what they derive from the powers of darkness that try to activate all that they represent. So thank him that your God is an eternal God. Let's pray together. Father, after all of this, I feel like I really didn't clarify or say things the way I needed to and I wanted to. But I acknowledge that because the topic itself is so otherworldly. But we do thank you from the depths of our hearts that you are an eternal God who never changes. You have a, because you're an eternal God, you have an eternal everlasting love. You have an eternal, accurate, stable justice. But you also are a God who cannot lie, according to Hebrews. And you are also a God who will not and cannot deceive us. So we can take what you say at face value and know that it is true. And because we know it is true, we can experience a freedom and a joy and a confidence for today and the tomorrows that are ahead. Guide us through the rest of the day. Thank you for those who have come. We just thank, bless you and praise you for that. We're so grateful that you've given us an opportunity to meet together today. We pray this now all in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One of my favorites, too, since I first heard it from George Beverly Shea, which a few of you have heard of. And so I don't forget, there are refreshments uh, in the back when we conclude. And our um, benediction today is from Hebrews uh, chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, which also describes our eternal God. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.